Hello. Today's lecture will address the behavioral objectives for week seven in the syllabus. Because the file is so large, this will be presented in two parts. This is part A. Please make sure you watch both parts to avoid missing critical information. So we're going to start off with mus the musculoskeletal system, cast care. So let's talk a little bit about the two most common types of cast that you will see. One is the plaster of Paris and the other is a fiberglass. So a plaster of Paris cast is sort of the old school type of cast. Um, it is something that we still do see used. Uh, what are some of the benefits? Well, the benefits of the plaster of Paris cast is that it is very inexpensive and it molds really well. The downside of the plaster of Paris is that it cannot get wet. If it gets wet, it will get mushy and it will not hold its form and then it needs to be changed. Also, it tends to be quite heavy um, and they can take quite long to dry. So fiberglass casts, the benefit of these are they are much lighter, they dry fairly quickly, water will just slide off of them. So if water gets on top of it, it's not a big deal. You just dust it off and it'll just come on off. The downside is that they are much more expensive. Uh, the other benefit of a fiberglass cast for kids is they can come in fun, different colors. So cast care. You want to keep the casted extremity elevated on pillows or a similar support for the first day or so or as directed by the health professional. Avoid indenting the cast while still wet to avoid creating pressure points. Observe the extremities, the fingers or toes for any evidence of swelling or discoloration, darker or lighter than the comparable extremity. So you do want to compare both sides to make sure that they look the same or similar. Uh, and then if there are any problems, uh, you want to contact the health professional. You want to check movement and sensation of the visible extremities frequently. Uh, you also want to follow the health professional's orders regarding any restrictions of activities. Restrict strenuous activities for the first few days. You want them to engage in quiet activities. Um, you do want to encourage the use of the joints above and below the cast. Um, of the, extrem the ex affected extremity. Encourage frequent rest for a few days, keeping the injured extremity elevated while resting. Allow, uh, do not allow, I beg your pardon, the affected limb to hang down for any length of time. Again, we wanna keep that injured uh, extremity, if it's the upper extremity, keep it elevated like in a sling while you're upright. Um, you want to elevate a lower extremity when you're sitting and you want to avoid standing for too long. Do not allow the child to put anything inside of the cast. Keep small items that might be placed inside the cast away from small children. Keep a clear path for ambulation. Remove toys, hazardous floor rugs, pets, or other items over which the child might stumble. They already have a fracture. We don't want them falling. You wanna use crutches appropriately if they have a lower limb fracture. The crutches should fit properly. Having the crutches extend to about six inches from the sides of the feet ensures the maximal base of support when the person is ambulating. The crutches should be two inches below the axilla. The elbow should be flexed and then when the client holds the crossbars, um, that way they're not having any kind of uh, pressure in the axilla and the, the elbows are able to hold the child properly. Um, you wanna have a soft rubber tip on the bottom of the crutches to prevent slipping. Um, and again, please make sure that the uh, axilla on the crutches is well padded. After a cast is removed, the family should be instructed to soak the affected area in warm water every day to help soften and gently remove the dry flaky skin and apply moisturizing lotion. Do not scrub 
this skin off. It will come off in due time on its own. Just be very gentle. Notify the doctor if unusual odor beneath the cast appears, tingling, burning, or numbness in the casted arm or leg, drainage through the cast appears, swelling or inability to move the fingers or toes, slippage of the cast, the cast cracks, soft or loosening of the crust, uh, if there is a sudden or unexplained fever, unusual fussiness or irritability in an infant or child, fingers or toes that are becoming bluish or whitish, pain that is not relieved by comfort measures like repositioning or pain medication. Remember, an early sign of compartment syndrome uh, can be uh, pain that is unrelieved with medications or repositioning. Also an early sign would be that tingling or paresthesias. Other things that you would see in compartment syndrome would be, we already mentioned the pain, pallor, that pressure, paresthesia, paralysis, and pulselessness. All of those things are not good things that we wanna see. Uh, guidelines for brace care. Basically, the brace should be as comfortable as possible and the child should have adequate mobility while wearing the brace. Begin wearing the brace for periods of one to two hours and then progress two to four hours and then as long as is necessary. Uh, check the skin at one to two hour intervals initially and then lengthen it to every four hours. Once the skin has been clear for several days, um, then we know that we are probably not gonna have issues. If there is redness, um, then they may need to have the brace off to allow the skin to clear up. If breakdown has occurred and the brace cannot be replaced, um, note that they may have to figure something out uh, because we don't want to have skin breakdown. Um, generally, uh, you don't uh, put a brace on an area where the skin is open. So the orthotic physician uh, will have to adjust the brace so they are not having issues. Always have the child wear a clean white sock under a brace that is on the foot or lower leg, and then a t-shirt or an other thin white liner beneath the brace if it's on top. Uh, be sure the liner is wrinkle-free under the brace. Uh, we do this this way if there's any kind of drainage on the socks or the t-shirt, then we know that we have an issue with skin breakdown. We also want to avoid using powders or lotions that can cause the skin to break down. Toughen any sensitive areas using alcohol wipes. Reapply the brace when the skin returns to its normal color. Return to the physician or orthotic specialist if the discomfort or red areas persist or if the brace needs adjustment or repair or if it is outgrown. Check the brace daily for rough edges. So know that if a child has a fracture across the epiphyseal growth plate, this can cause a limb length discrepancy. It is important that limbs are compared for length as part of the musculoskeletal assessment. Safety information. The most dangerous sports to participate in are ice hockey, wrestling, and football. Also, by the way, parents should be taught not to pick their children up by their hands or arms. This can cause a dislocation of the elbow or shoulder. Traumatic injury. So a little bit about soft tissue injuries. These fall under the categories of contusions, dislocations, sprains, and strains. So what are we gonna do for these? Basically, we're gonna do the acronym RICE, uh, which is rest, ice, compress, and elevate. And then uh, you also can see that ice is, which is ice, compress, elevate, and support. You wanna rest the injured part, ice it immediately. Uh, typically it's, it's 20 to 30 minutes at a time. You don't wanna go longer than that because we don't wanna freeze the area. You can wear a elastic bandage for compression, um, elevation of the extremity, and immobilization and support. So caster splints as appropriate for the injury. Fractures, these are common in children. Um, the method of treatment is really um, a bit different in the pediatric population than what we see in the older population. Uh, 
Know that it's not very common to see uh, fractures in infants. As a matter of fact, it's pretty rare um, with the exception of a motor vehicle accident. Clavicles are the most frequently broken bone in childhood, especially in those younger than 10 years of age. In school-age children, here we can see issues with bicycles and sports injuries. Types of fractures. So you can have a compound or open fracture, and this is where the fractured bone protrudes through the skin. A complicated fracture where the bone fragments have damaged other organs or tissues. A comminuted fracture where the small fragments of the bone are broken from the fractured shaft and lie in the surrounding tissue. A green stick fracture is where the compressed side of the bone bends, but the tension side of the bone breaks. So then you have an incomplete fracture. So imagine when you break a matchstick, but it doesn't break all the way. That's sort of what this looks like. Uh, I already mentioned growth plate injuries, but I'll mention them again here. Know that these can be the weakest point of the long bones is the cartilage growth plate, or also called the epiphyseal growth plate. And this is a frequent site of damage during trauma. So we do have to pay attention if this is uh, damage that we um, do measure the limb lengths. Treatment, uh, they may include an open reduction, so it could be surgery um, and internal fixation to prevent growth disturbances. What are some clinical manifestations of fractures? So swelling, pain or tenderness, deformity, diminished functional use. They may have bruising or severe muscular rigidity and crepitus. Bone healing and remodeling. So it's much faster in children than in adults. In neonatal period, two to three weeks. In early childhood, four weeks. In later childhood, it's six to eight weeks. Adolescence, eight to 12 weeks. Diagnostic examination. Here you want to obtain information from the person who observed the injury. The x-ray is the most useful diagnostic tool. Therapeutic management. Often you're going to see a reduction, immobilization. We want to restore functioning. We want to prevent any further injury and damage. Um, often there will be a splint, a cast, or possibly surgical reduction and fixation. Remember the P's for issues with fractures, pain and point of tenderness, pulse, this is distal to the fracture site, pallor, so is it pale, paresthesia, so this is that numbness or tingling, or is it completely numb? So that would definitely not be good. Um, and this is the sensation distal to the fracture site. Paralysis, again, uh, the lack of movement distal to the fracture site, as well as pressure. So the first dysfunction that we're gonna talk about is developmental dysplasia of the hip, DDH. It used to be called congenital dislocation of the hip, but we don't call it that anymore because um, that was just really too simplistic. Please know that there's various um, stages of deformity for this. Uh, displacement of the femoral head will result from a shallow acetabulum. So that's what uh, DDH is. There is an increased risk with family history, firstborn, breech birth, twins, large babies, a little bit more with girls than boys, uh, more with the left hip, and this is associated with spina bifida. Uh, signs and symptoms. So we wanna check at birth to one year of life, and then until the child is walking with an obviously normal gait. So the Ortolani test, which is most reliable for four weeks and under, here we're going to flex the knees and hips. We're going to abduct each one, then both, um, and feel for a click. If it is present, then it is positive for dysplasia. The Barlow test, also most reliable for four weeks and under, here the hips are examined one at a time. The hip is flexed. The thigh is adducted while pushing posteriorly in line of the shaft of the femur, causing the femoral head to dislocate posteriorly from the acetabulum. The dislocation is palpable as the femoral head slips out of the acetabulum. Ultrasound is also recommended for early diagnosis. 
When on their abdomen, the affected side will be flattened. Extra skin folds will be present on the affected inner thigh. Asymmetry of the gluteal folds will be present. Shortening of the limb on the affected side, also called Galietzi sign. If the child can walk, a Trendelenburg sign will be positive. When the child stands on the affected leg, the pelvis tilts downward on the good side. Treatment. The goal is to enlarge and deepen the socket with pressure. For infants less than six months of age, a Pavlik harness is used. It is worn continuously. The doctor will readjust the straps every one to two weeks, adjusting to the child's growth, usually worn for six to 12 weeks. It is generally not removed. Um, sometimes doctors may give different instructions, but in general, uh, they prefer not to remove it. You want to teach the families to assess for pressure areas at least two to three times daily. Give the infants a sponge bath and make sure that the diaper um, is placed under the straps. In general, the goal is to maintain the hips in an abduction position. If on the abdomen, you want to position the legs in a frog leg position. If not stable, a surgical reduction with a hip spike of cast application may be done. The cast will be changed to adjust for growth. This is worn for three months, and then they will wear an orthosis. Uh, age six to 24 months, um, a gradual reduction by traction followed by a hip spike of cast may be used. Surgery and a hip spike of cast worn for three months may also be necessary. Children over this age require surgery, casting, and extensive rehabilitation. Bryant's skin traction is the most common type used with DDH. The legs are at a 90 degree angle and the buttocks are slightly elevated off the bed. Nursing, for the hip spica cast, do not use the spica bar to move the child. This bar helps to keep the cast stronger. Also, you might use a, a little bit of a plastic lining around the perineal opening to protect from soiling. Allow the plaster cast to dry. It may take 24 to 48 hours, um, and so they may be on a pillow. You want to change their position every two hours uh, to allow for even drying. Do neural circulation checks. You want to increase fluid and fiber to prevent constipation. Monitor lung sounds. Uh, chest physiotherapy is needed. If in skin traction and it is okayed by the doctor, sometimes they might actually let a child out of skin traction for no more than one hour each day, but this must be approved by the physician. And remember, we do not remove people in, for, from skeletal traction. That is a big no-no. You want to hold and cuddle the child at this time as much as possible. Um, and then provide for ADLs as well, and maybe even one meal, if they are given that permission to be out of the traction for the one hour. You do wanna give appropriate toys for diversion and make sure the child does not put anything inside the cast. Congenital club foot. Here there are three problems typically. 95% are talipes echino varus. The forefoot curves towards the heel, Echinus is the downward rotation, so they walk on their toes. Varus, there is an inward rotation of the ankle, therefore they walk on their outer ankles. This is twice as common in boys. 50% are bilateral. The cause is unknown, but there is a positive family history. Diagnosis, true club foot cannot be put in proper position manually. Treatment. There's something called a Ponsetti method. This is where there's serial casting every few days for one to two weeks, and then at one to two week intervals um, for six to eight, six, I beg your pardon, six to ten weeks. Casting is maintained until surgery is done, then a long leg cast is applied for three weeks, followed by Ponsetti sandals with a bar to maintain position. Nursing, we're gonna do cast care, which was already discussed. Um, in general, we usually apply ice packs uh, right after surgery um, 
And this is usually for about 24 hours uh, to help decrease uh, inflammation. This is done intermittently. Um, you also want to elevate the lower extremities. Um, usually the ice packs are applied first and once the child begins to wake up, then the child will be medicated for pain. Of course, we always monitor the vital signs and watch for signs and symptoms of bleeding and then a few days later for signs and symptoms of infection. If they're using a brace, you want to assess for pressure points and have the child wear socks. And also please remember to refer to that brace care, which we already did discuss. Leg calf Perth's disease. This is an aseptic necrosis of the femoral head due to a disturbance of the circulation, mostly seen in boys, most commonly between four and eight years of age. The disease occurs in four stages. Stage one is the avascular stage. This is an aseptic necrosis or infarction of the femoral capital epiphysis with degenerative changes producing flattening of the upper surface of the femoral head. Stage two is fragmentation or resorptive stage. Here the capital bone resorption and revascularization with fragmentation that give a modeled appearance on the radiographs. Stage three is reossification stage, and here you have new bone formation. And then stage four is the healing or remodeling stage. Here, uh, there is a gradual reformation of the head of the femur without radiotranslucency, and this occurs until skeletal maturity. Diagnosis is MRI and bone scan. Know that these will show earlier than an x-ray. Signs and symptoms. Here there is an insidious onset. Symptoms are minor for several months. They may have pain in the groin, hip, and referred to the knee that may worsen when getting out of bed or after a long active day. They may have chronic or an intermittent limp, pain, and stiffness. Treatment. The focus is on maintaining a functioning hip and a pain-free healthy hip. Initial treatment is rest and non-weight bearing activity. NSAIDs can help with pain. Traction may use to maintain abduction and internal rotation of the hip to keep the femoral hip in the socket. Casting or soft tissue release may be followed with braces. Surgical correction if conservative treatment is done if um, conservative treatment is not successful. Uh, swimming can help to promote mobility. Slipped femoral capital epiphysis. This can be abbreviated SFCE. Here, this is where the femoral head is displaced from the femoral neck at the proximal epiphyseal plate in a posterior and inferior direction. This is seen during the growth spurt most often. Again, seen more in boys than girls. It can be associated with endocrine disorders, growth hormone therapy, renal osteodystrophy, obesity, and radiation therapy. The signs and symptoms, they may be obese. They may have a limp on the affected side. Pain in the hip, it can be continuous or intermittent. Uh, frequently, it is referred to the groin or the anterior medial aspect of the thigh or the knee. They're, they may have a restricted internal rotation on adduction with external rotation deformity, loss of abduction and internal rotation as the severity increases. They also can have a shortening of the lower extremity that is affected. Diagnosis, it is confirmed with x-ray, and treatment usually is surgical pinning. They may be in Russell's or Buck's traction prior to surgery. Buck's traction, this, this is a skin traction. The leg is on the bed and there is a horizontal pull. Russell's traction is a skin traction, but there is a vertical and horizontal pull. There is a padded sling behind the knee. Uh, bone surgery, this is what is going to end up happening. So we know that we're going to need to manage their pain. Uh, we want good nutrition. Uh, we're going to need to monitor for any signs and symptoms of hemorrhage. So watching their vital signs, uh, monitoring uh, for any kind of compartment syndrome. Uh, mobility will be as allowed. 
Um, if they are obese, we may want to uh, start looking at weight reduction um, practices and, and maybe give them a, a dietary consult. Um, if this is not treated, callus formation can occur, and then they can have a, de a deformed hip with a limited range of motion, which is not something that we want to have happen. Scoliosis. This is a lateral um, curve, typically. So uh, it's usually an S or a C-shaped curve. Um, it can be structural or functional. Functional can be corrected voluntarily with posture. Um, it disappears when the person is laying down. It is not progressive, and it can be just treated with exercises. Structural or idiopathic scoliosis, which is the most common type, is most noticeable during the pre-adolescent growth spurt. Signs and systems. Asymmetry of the rib cage, uneven hips and shoulders, one-sided rib hump, and a prominent scapula. Failure of the curve to straighten when the child bends forward with the knees straight and with the arms hanging freely. This is called Adam's position. They may actually complain that their clothes don't fit right. The hams are uneven and their bras feel uneven and they don't fit properly. Diagnosis. They can do a standing x-ray which will determine the degree of the curvature. A moi photography and COP technique also documents the degree of curvature. Curvatures less than 10% are considered postural variations. The Reiser scale is used to determine skeletal maturity by grading the amount of bone on top of the hip bone using radiographs. Treatment, observation, bracing with or without exercises and possibly surgery depending on the severity. Mild curves, 10 to 25 degrees, do not require treatment, but they must see the doctor every three months and have an x-ray every six months. Moderate curves, which are 25 degrees to 45 degrees, require bracing to maintain the current curvature and prevent an increase in curvature. These are worn until skeletal maturity. There are a wide variety of braces that can be used. A Milwaukee brace, is used for a very high kyphotic curve. Um, we don't see those used a whole heck of a lot. A Boston brace and a Wilmington brace or a thoracal, lumbar, sacral orthosis brace can be used for lorothoracic and lumbar curves. Treatment can begin when they are diagnosed. Please note that they must wear the brace 23 out of 24 hours a day. Often spinal and abdominal strengthening exercises are prescribed. Severe curves, these are curves that are greater than 45 degrees, requires surgery and spinal fusion with the insertion of rods and other type of instrumentations. There are many different types of surgeries. They may have a spinal fusion with a bone donor site on the iliac crest. Therefore, they have two incision sites and they both need to monitor it for signs and symptoms of infection. Uh, the patient may need to be log rolled and immobilized after surgery. They may also require a plastic molded brace with a halo or a cast. After surgery, the child often wears a brace for several months. Activity restriction often includes no bending, twisting, slouching, lifting 10 pounds or more, vacuuming, lawn mowing, bicycling, horseback riding, skiing, rollerblading, PE, or driving. They may walk and gently swim until the doctor states otherwise. Nursing, refer to brace care already mentioned. Promote sense of self by allowing the child to choose their exercise time and time to be out of their brace. Encourage the child to join a peer support group. Pre-op teaching, teach about the procedure, what to expect, what they will feel, how to log roll. This is very important for them to know how to do this before they have surgery. Uh, range of motion, use of the incentive spirometer. This is something else you may want them to demonstrate prior to surgery and pain management. Again, showing them how to use the PCA pump prior to surgery. That way afterwards, um, they won't have any difficulty.
post-op care, obviously monitoring vital signs, respiratory rate, depth, rhythm, and effort, monitor for signs of hemorrhage, what is their SAO2, bowel sounds, breath sounds, intake and output, monitoring for nausea and vomiting, the pedal pulse is we need to monitor at least hourly. Um, initially, you might see the lower extremities a little bit more pale and maybe a little bit weaker pulse. Um, and they may have a little bit of edema, but this typically will resolve in a few days. You want to report decreased neurovascular functioning quickly. Uh, they may have TED hose or sequential compression devices, um, which will be worn um, when they are in bed um, and until they are ambulating. Uh, range of motion exercises are very important. And again, log rolling. Note that they may have chest tubes depending on the approach of the surgery, and there you need to or you need to be monitoring the chest tubes that they are functioning and they are draining appropriately, and then monitor the drainage itself. You know we want to monitor for uh, hemorrhage in the chest tubes as well. Uh, they may have a nasogastric tube to intermittent suction because they are at a high risk for paralytic ileus. When the bowel sounds are present, then it can be removed. Uh, they may have a Foley catheter in place, um, and you want to watch for any signs and symptoms of infection. And then, of course, pain management. Initially, it may be around the clock for 48 hours, um, utilizing a PCA. Ensure the child performs ADLs with the activity restrictions. Often, it is helpful to use a raised toilet seat and use a hard, high-backed chair um, this is just a lot more comfortable and it's easier for the child to get up and sit down when they have the brace on. Because of decreased activity, it's important to modify the diet to prevent weight gain and constipation. Most patients walk by post-op day two to three, and they are typically discharged by days five through seven. Juvenile idiopathic arthritis. We used to call it juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Um, this is an inflammatory disease with an unknown cause. The peak onset is one to three years of age. It must occur younger than 16 years of age. It is two times more common in girls than boys. 90% have a negative rheumatoid factor. There are many types. In general, the pathophysiology is there's chronic inflammation of the synovium with joint effusion and eventual erosion, destruction, and fibrosis of the articular cartilage. We often will see signs and symptoms with stiffness, swelling, warmth. Usually you don't see redness, joint pain, stiffness, immobility. Uh, note that the immobility increases in the morning um, and or after inactivity. And then they can also have a loss of motion. Diagnosis, there is no definitive test, but there are four criteria established by the American College of Rheumatology. One is that onset before age 16 years of age. The second is arthritis in one or more joints. Three, arthritis for six weeks or more. And there is an exclusion of other forms of arthritis. Of the people with a systemic onset, eight to 20% develop iridocyclitis, also called uveitis, which is an inflammation of the iris and ciliary body. This requires the ophthalmologist's attention. The three goals of treatment are preserving joint function, preventing deformities, and always with children, we want to promote growth and development. Treatment. In general, the medications, the start-off ones, are the NSAIDs. So these are your first line medications. Often we start with ibuprofen or naproxen. The next drugs would be disease modifying anti rheumatic drugs or the cytotoxic drugs. Um, these are used in children with severe arthritis that have failed the NSAIDs. The most common drug here is methotrexate. Um, Next are the biologic disease modifying anti rheumatic drug agents like tumor necrosis factor alpha receptor blockers. An example of this is antanercept. This is given once or twice a week subcutaneously. Here, side effects would be allergic reaction at the injection site, increased injection, I'm sorry, increased 
uh, risk for infection, and rarely demyelinating disease and pancytopenia. Physical care. Uh, here, we want to preserve joint functioning and prevent deformities. So pool treatment is great for exercise and range of motion, and it's like a non-weight bearing exercise um, or very minimal weight exercise because you can be floating. Um, we are, they are recommended to do non-weight bearing exercises. Any low to no impact activity can be done. Hot packs for 20 minutes throughout the day can also help with pain and stiffness. Uh, whirlpool baths, paraffin soaks, um, soaking the hands for 10 minutes in warm water multiple times a day can offer some relief. Um, often they will use ice packs after they have had physical therapy. Um, so unless they've had physical therapy, uh, people find the warm packs um, more soothing. In the morning, you can use a heating blanket with a set timer to go on about an hour before the child wakes up. Then they can take their medication with some food and then let them sleep for an hour. Um, and then they can get up and take a nice hot shower or bath. This kind of lets the medication kick in. They may use splints at night. Um, it is necessary to balance activity and rest. Um, we do want the child to go to school and do as many ADLs as possible. Again, we want to avoid excess weight gain because we want to decrease the stress on the joints. We want them to be on a comfortable mattress. Often it is found that a firm mattress is most comfortable. Corticosteroids can also be used. Know that here uh, we want to use the lowest possible dose and taper the dose please remember long-term use can cause growth retardation. Um, this also can be used for uveitis. Osteogenic sarcoma can also be called osteosarcoma. This is uh, most frequently encountered um, in kids between uh, 10 and 25 years of age. Um, this is a malignant bone cancer um, and like I said, the peak incidence is between 10 and 25 years of age. More than half occur in the distal part of the femur, with the rest involving the humerus, tibia, pelvis, jaw, and phalanges. Signs and symptoms, pain, swelling, fixed bone nodules, unexplained weight loss, limping, decreased range of motion, and possibly a pathologic fracture at the tumor site. Diagnosis is x-ray, CT, MRI, and they may do a tumor bi biopsy to confirm the diagnosis. Treatment, chemotherapy and or radiation before and after surgery, amputation, limb salvage procedure, or rotational plastic procedure. So nursing, it really depends on the type of surgery. Obviously, amputation is more difficult to cope with than a limb salvage procedure. Postoperatively, we need to check the vital signs, hemorrhage, wound site dressing, monitor for pain, signs and symptoms of body image issues like refusal to look at the body part, overexposure or hiding the part, fear of rejection or unwanted attention from others, feelings of shame and embarrassment, preoccupation with the loss and distorted perception of body image. The site must fully heal before chemotherapy or prosthetic fitting. Help the child before surgery by letting them interact with kids well adapted who have experienced a similar situation. Encourage the child to care for their residual stump and let them know that they can still participate in sports with special prosthesis. Plan with the child how they will tell their friends and what type of things they may face at school. Physical therapy, rehabilitation, and chemotherapy must be followed up after discharge. A permanent prosthesis is typically fitted in six to eight weeks after surgery. Long-term survival rate is about 78%. Phantom limb pain may develop following an amputation in approximately 60 to 80% of people. This symptom is characterized by pain, tingling, itching, burning, and or cramping in the area of amputated leg. The child and family need to know that the sensations are real and not imagined. Morphine, morphine 
gabapentin and ketamine have been used successfully in children to decrease the pain, but not completely eliminate it. Ewing sarcoma. This is the second most common bone cancer in children. It arises in the bone marrow from the femur, tibia, fibula, ulna, humerus, vertebrae, pelvis, scapula, ribs, and skull. Most commonly occurs under 30 years of age. Signs and symptoms, pain, soft tissue swelling around the affected bone, fever, weight loss, possible limp, Diagnosis, biopsy, treatment, intensive radiation, and chemotherapy. Amputation may not be necessary. High doses of radiation can cause skin to peel and increase pigmentation. Protect the skin from sunlight, hot and cold temperature, and wear loose clothing. Prognosis, cure rates exceed 78% in children with small extremity tumors and no metastasis it significantly decreases with metastasis. So in your textbook, um, they have a table on the physical effects of immobility. Note that this is content from fundamentals, so it is expected that you do know this. I'm not gonna go over it. Um, the, your textbook talks about primary effects, secondary effects, and nursing considerations. So please note, the table is in uh, chapter 29. So next we're gonna talk about neuromuscular uh, conditions, and this is in your chapter 30. So cerebral palsy, this is a nonspecific term applied to disorders characterized by an early onset of impaired movement and posture. In the past, it was thought that anoxia plays the most significant role in the pathologic state of the brain damage, which is often secondary to other causative mechanisms. But now it's believed to stem from pre-existing brain abnormalities, genetics, infections, and prematurity. 70 to 80% have unknown prenatal factors. Classifications, spastic, uh, so this could be also called pyramidal. This is characterized by persistence primitive reflexes, positive Babinski reflex, ankle clonus, exaggerated stretch reflexes, eventual development of contractures. Seventy to eighty percent of all cases of CP fall into this category. Uh, they can have diplegia, where all extremities are affected, lower more than upper. Um, this is about 30 to 40 percent of spastic CP. Tetraplegia, as all four extremities are involved, um, and this can also even include the mouth, pharynx, and tongue. This is about 10 to 15 percent of spastic CP. Triplegia, three limbs are involved. Monoplegia, only one limb is involved. Hemiplegia, where it's um, one side of the body, body or the, the upper extremity um, is more affected than the lower extremity, which is um, 20 to 30% of spastic CP. Other features are, are hypertonicity with poor control of posture balance and coordinated motion, movements, movements, uh, impairment of fine and gross motor skills. Dyskinetic, so this is a non-spastic um, extrapyramidal type. Here you can see athetoid movements like chorea, which would be involuntary, irregular jerking movements characterized by slow, <clears throat> worm-like writhing movements that usually involve the extremities, trunk, neck, facial muscles, and tongue. Dystonic, slow twisting movements of the trunk or extremities or abnormal posturing. 
Um, and also they can have involvement of the pharyngeal, laryngeal, and oral muscles causing drooling and dysarthria. So they can have uh, issues with their speech. The ataxic, uh, here you would see a wide-based gape. Rapid, repetitive movements are performed poorly. They can have a disintegration of movements of the upper extremities when the child is reaching for an object. And then you can have a mixed type, which is a combination of spastic CP and dyskinetic CP. Uh, they may be labeled mixed when there is no specific motor pattern that is dominant. However, this term is really losing favor to more precise descriptions of motor function and an affected area of the brain which is involved. So signs and symptoms, really it depends on the degree of the anoxia and the portion that the brain is affected. About 30 to 50% have significant cognitive impairment and even higher percentage have mild cognitive impairment and learning deficits. They usually have a developmental delay, poor suck, abnormal muscle tone, continued primitive reflexes after six months of age, and poor head control after three months. Um, they can have stiff or rigid arms or legs, an arching back, they can be floppy, <clears throat> or have a limp body posture. Uh, they may not be able to sit without support by eight months. Um, they may use only one side of the body or arms to crawl. They may be very irritable or frequently crying. Failure to smile by three months. They may have feeding difficulties or persistent gagging. Um, or after six months, they may even be using uh, pushing the tongue uh, the food out of the mouth with the tongue. Um, and then they also can have scissoring of the legs and toe walking. Other problems associated with CP include ADHD, seizures, uh, tonic clonic with an onset at two to six years of age, poor speech, poor feeding, a decreased ability to close the mouth causing drooling. They also can have a high risk for aspiration. Often dental problems occur because of poor hygiene, seizure medications, they may have a poor diet, um, and they may also have a lack of fluoride. Orthopedic complications also can occur. Also, you might see nystagmus, amblyopia, hearing loss, and constipation. Diagnosis is really based on the clinical findings, the abnormal positioning, developmental delays, history of prematurity or an anoxic event, and the neurological examination. Typically, this is confirmed by two years of age. Treatment. Here they may use an implantation of a pump to infuse baclofen directly into the intrathecal space. Um, this will help to provide relief of spasticity. Note that hypotonia can occur. Outpatient visits to refill the pump and dosage adjustments occur about every three to six months. Abrupt withdrawal of intrathecal baclofen may result in adverse effects such as a rebound spasticity, pruritus, hyperthermia, rhabdomyolysis, disseminated intravascular coagulation, multi-organ failure, and even death. So intrathecal baclofen uh, withdrawal may actually mimic sepsis. Botulin toxin A can also be administered IM to decrease spasticity. Note that this may cause dry mouth. This allows the muscles to be stretched so the child can move without orthosis. It is not administered orally by subcutaneous injection or by IV infusion. So it is injected IM. Anti-epileptic medications and medications for ADHD are frequently used. The focus of therapy is to establish locomotion, communication, help the child to develop to their fullest potential, correct deficits, uh, and correct any defects, uh, promote socialization, and provide educational opportunities. So nursing, Focusing on adequate nutrition, you want to give small amounts of food in each bite. 
There's a picture in your textbook demonstrating the use of a manual jaw support while feeding the child. Do not lean the child back when you are feeding them. You want to keep them upright. Um, you can actually uh, help the child to let them feed themselves um, by giving them a large pad padded handled utensil. Um, you want to maintain skin integrity, support and position the body with pillows, rolls, and blankets. Also assess the skin over bony prominences and under braces. Promote physical mobility. You want to do range of motion, uh, teaching the parents the correct use of wheelchairs, braces, crutches, and other adaptive devices. Um, they will have a PT and OT consult. Uh, you really want to encourage motor development, um, skills with play and stretch tendons and muscles with exercises, but you can do all of these by uh, playing with the child and that way you can make it fun. Promote safety by using safety belts and wheelchairs, helmets if they have chronic seizures, and then making sure that they do have that medic alert bracelet on. You can promote growth and development by encouraging fine and gross motor development. Provide age-appropriate toys and stimulation. Use play therapy, special education, and speech therapist. Foster parent knowledge and emotional support. Teach parents about all of the ADLs, medications, side effects, health promotion, dental care, immunizations, histories and physicals, vision and hearing, as well as support groups. Check with Regional Center for possible education and respite care services. Spina bifida. This is a neural tube defect. The cause is unknown, but chemicals, medications, and poor nutrition, especially decreased folic acid, may affect this occurrence. Also, there may be a genetic link. Diagnosis. An alpha fetal protein done between 16 and 18 weeks of gestation can indicate a neural tube defect. An ultrasound in utero especially um, can also uh, identify this. Usually, uh, this child is going to be born uh, by C-section because we want to prevent trauma. Also note that they will do a CT, MRI, history and physical, and then examine the lesion and do a neuro exam once the child is born. Uh, types of spina bifida. So you've got spina bifida occulta, and this is where there is a failure of the posterior vertebral arches to fuse. This is most commonly at the fifth lumbar or first sacral vertebrae. There is no herniation of spinal cord or meninges. The condition is often not visible externally. They may just have like a little tuft of hair or a little hemangioma over the site. Uh, often nobody knows that they have this. Spina bifida cystica, on the other hand, there's a defect in the closure of the posterior vertebral arch with protrusion through bony spine. So here you could have a meningocele where there is a sac-like protrusion through the bony defect containing the meninges and cerebral spinal fluid. The sac is covering um, defect, maybe translucent or membranous. A myelomeningocele, here you have a sac-like herniation through the bony defect. This is holding the meninges, cerebral spinal fluid, as well as a portion of the spinal cord or nerve roots. Fluid leakage may also occur. The lesion is poorly covered with imperfect tissue. So signs and symptoms of spina bifida, cystica, so this is the one that's coming, that's outside of the body. Um, here they can have sensory disturbances, which are usually parallel motor dysfunction below the second lumbar vertebrae because that's if often a place where you can see this. Um, so if it is below the second lumbar vertebrae, here you would see flaccid or partial paralysis of the lower extremities, varying degrees um, of sensory deficit, overflow incontinence with constant dribbling of the urine, a lack of bowel control, and sometimes you can even see a prolapsed rectum. 
if it is below the third sacral vertebrae, they may not have any motor impairment at all. They may have something called saddle anesthesia with bladder and anal sphincter paralysis. Joint deformities, uh, sometimes we can see these in utero. Uh, the talipes valgus or varus contractures can occur. Uh, kyphosis, lumbar sacral scoliosis, and hip dislocations. Spina bifida occulta, as I mentioned before, frequently you might not see any kind of manifestations, maybe just a little uh, tuft of hair or a little dimpling. Treatment. So preoperatively, here they're gonna cover the sac with a sterile saline dressing and change it every two to four hours. We wanna keep that area nice and moist. They will cover the dressing with a surgical drape, plastic side down to prevent any kind of contamination with stool. We wanna keep the dressing moist, as I mentioned. They have to be placed prone with the hips slightly flexed and abducted. They won't be wearing a diaper. Um, you wanna comfort them and cuddle them and touch them. Usually the surgery is gonna take place. They're gonna close it up um, in 12 to 18 hours. So it's relatively soon after birth. If the child, if it's gonna take a little longer, and if the infant, um, they want the baby to be fed, um, you will do so uh, with the infant's head turned to the side. So they will still be in that uh, prone position, but their head will be turned to the side. Um, improved surgical techniques uh, don't really alter the major disabilities and deformities um, or the chronic urinary tract and pulmonary infections uh, that affect this baby's uh, quality of life. Post-op, vital signs, hemorrhage, monitoring to see if there's any cerebral spinal fluid leakage. Um, so you wanna check the drainage for glucose. Um, if it's like light yellow, um, because the cerebral spinal fluid does con contain glucose. Um, Postoperatively, usually it'll be a prone or a side sideline position, depending on the doctor's orders. Um, monitor intake and output, pain management, weigh them daily, uh, feeding them when their bowel sounds are present, check for signs and symptoms of infection, especially in meningitis. Uh, you want gentle range of motion, except for the hip if they have that um, developmental dysplasia of the hip, no rectal temperatures, um, because remember, they are at risk for rectal prolapse. Orthopedic considerations. This depends on the level of disability. They may use crutches, braces, a walker, or they may be wheelchair bound. Genital urinary function. If they have a neurogenic bladder, um, here we want to preserve renal functioning and we want to have an optimal urinary continence. They need to have some type of regular emptying of the bladder. Um, so it's not uncommon for them to do a clean intermittent catheterization every three to four hours or they can have a surgical procedure such as a vesicotomy for urinary drainage. Many of these children are able to attain social continence with a continent urinary diversion, commonly referred to as a Mitrofanoff procedure. In this procedure, a catheterizable channel is surgically created from the appendix, ureter, or tapered bowel. Urinary tract infections must be treated immediately. Bowel function maintained with dietary modifications, regular toileting habits, laxative suppositories, enemas, and fiber supplements to prevent constipation and impaction. Older children and adolescents seeking more independence may attain bowel continence and a higher quality of life after undergoing an antigrade continence enema procedure. In a procedure similar to the Mitrofanoff, the appendix or ileum is used to create a catheterizable channel with an attachment of the proximal end to the colon. The distal end of the channel exits through a small abdominal stoma. Every one to two days, a catheter is passed through the stoma, allowing enema solution to be instilled directly into the colon. After administration of the enema solution, the child sits on the toilet for 30 to 60 minutes as stool is flushed out through the rectum. Assess the lower extremities because of a possible decrease in sensation. They may not feel scratches or pressure points. 
check car seats and bath water for temperature so that the child will not burn as they may not be able to feel it. Please note that a dosage of 400 micrograms of folic acid will prevent 50 to 70 percent of all cases of neural tube defects and it should be taken one month before conception through the first trimester. Hydrocephalus can occur in anywhere from 80 to 90 percent of cases with myelomeningocele. So obviously hydrocephalus has already been talked about, but know that children that have myelomeningocele, you need to assess for this. So you need to assess the head circumference um, at least every shift and then teach parents signs and symptoms of issues. Early signs of hydrocephalic, hydrocephalus again include signs of um, uh, infection we want to monitor for. Um, you also want to monitor for temperature instability, irritability, lethargy, and then signs and symptoms of intracranial, uh, increased intracranial pressure. Note that the higher the defect, the higher risk for hydrocephalus. Um, and in relation to spina bifida cystica, know that it's not uncommon to see children um, that have that, they have a higher risk for latex allergies. And this typically is a result of repeated exposure to latex in the hospital. Parents need to be able to identify items containing uh, latex, um, and they need to carry an anaphylactic kit like an EpiPen. Um, it's important for them to practice the use of the EpiPen uh, so that way, in case they need it, it's, they're not learning how to use it during an emergency. Um, it is important to avoid exposing these children to latex when they are hospitalized as much as possible. Know that there may be a cross-reaction to a number of foods if they have a latex allergy. These foods are cow's milk, bananas, kiwis, avocados, and chestnuts. Medical items containing latex include things like latex gloves, bandages, tapes, and stethoscopes. Home items containing latex are things like glue, balloons, balls, chewing gum, feeding nipples, some disposable diapers, water toys, wheelchair cushions, even the elastic in underwear may have latex. Um, note that all latex items are not labeled, so they really need to uh, pay very close attention to what it is that they are using. Lastly, we're going to talk about pseudohypertrophic muscular dystrophy, DMD. Um, you might also hear this uh, referred to as Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. This is an X-linked recessive disorder seen in boys. The onset is during the first uh, three to seven years of life. Um, that's not correct, I beg your pardon. Uh, you'll see this uh, between the ages of three to seven years of age. Uh, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy can result from a mutation of the gene that encodes dystrophin, which is a protein product in skeletal muscles. There is a gradual degeneration of muscle fibers that causes progressive weakness and a wasting of symmetrical muscle groups with increasing disability and deformity. Characteristics, early onset usually, as I said before, between the ages of three and seven. Then they have progressive muscular weakness, wasting, and contractures. Calf muscle hypertrophy um, can occur in most patients. Typically, there's a loss of independent ambulation by 9 through 12 years of age. It is slowly progressive, generalized weakness um, during the teenage years, um, and sadly, there is a relentless progression until the person typically will die from respiratory or cardiac failure. So the signs and symptoms, often you will see a waddling type gait, lordosis, they fall frequently. Um, they do something called Gower sign, and this is where the child will turn onto their side or abdomen. They flex their knees to assume a kneeling position. And then with their knees extended, they gradually push the torso to an upright position by walking the hands up the legs. And here you can see the picture of the person with their um, 
hands uh, on their knee and then they push up. Uh, you also can see enlarged muscles, especially on the thighs and upper arms. They feel unusually firm. Um, and then also the tops of the arms, legs, calves, and trunk typically are initially affected. Um, later, then you can see a profound muscular atrophy. Um, please note that uh, a little bit of cognitive impairment uh, may be noted and then frank mental deficits occur in about 25% of the patients. Um, complications include deformities of the hip, knees, and ankles, um, disuse atrophy, and obesity. Diagnosis. Here you can see history and physical, elevated CPKs, elevated AST. The muscle, muscle biopsy will show degeneration of muscle fibers, fibrosis, and fatty tissue. The electromyelogram will show a decrease in the amplitude and duration of the motor unit potential. Treatment. Sadly, there really is no effective treatment at this time, but lots of research is happening. The use of corticosteroids, prednisone, and deflazacort has been evaluated as a treatment for DMD. Uh, it has been noted to uh, increase muscle strength and improve performance and pulmonary function uh, with a significant decrease in the progression of weakness when the prednisone was administered for six months up to two years. The major side effects in these studies included weight gain and a cushionoid facial appearance. The more active the child is, the longer they are able to avoid becoming wheelchair bound. The goal is to prevent and treat complications such as contracture deformities, atrophy of disuse, infections, obesity, cardiac failure, respiratory difficulty, and failure. Focus on promoting independence, mobility, psychosocial support, and monitor cardiac and respiratory functioning. Please note that there are many devices available for children with neuromuscular diseases to assist them in clearing their airways when the cough reflex is ineffective or diminished. And you can look through your book to see uh, the wide variety of devices that are available. Um, they also can do um, an abdominal thrusts, which are similar to the Heimlich maneuver. So parents often will do these kinds of um, activities um, to uh, assist with uh, clearance of the lungs. Please note that um, routine chest physiotherapy for DMD um, actually has not been adequately evaluated for effectiveness in clearing the airway um, of mucus, except when they do know uh, when there's an issue with atelectasis and uh, mucus plugging in the airways, then it is, uh, then you do want to do the chest physiotherapy. But just to be doing it every single day, they don't have data um, that encourages that. Cardiac problems. Uh, patients with neuromuscular conditions may not be seen with the typical signs and symptoms of cardiac dysfunction. Therefore, symptoms such as weight loss, nausea, and vomiting, coughing, an increase in fatigue on performance of ADLs and orthopnea should be carefully evaluated to detect early signs of cardiomyopathy. The current life expectancy for DMD is about 26 years of age. Provide stimulation such as TV, reading to the child, radio, games, puzzles, etc. Do physical therapy and range of motion exercises as tolerated. Maintain proper alignment of the body and provide back support when in the wheelchair. Once they are wheelchair bound, watch for respiratory infections due to kyphosis development. Allow siblings to participate in care. Parents may be overprotective and feel guilty and hopeless. Encourage parents to express their feelings. Genetic counseling, especially for women with X-linked disorders, also wanna go for counseling. And refer to support groups, such as the Muscular Dystrophy Association of America. So this actually will conclude the part A for week seven. 
Um, so please be sure to read the textbook and complete the assignments for this week to facilitate the utilization of the content and applying it to nursing practice. Remember, this is part A for week seven. There is a part B, so you want to watch that. Thank you and have a good day. Bye-bye.